brief thing on what TCP and UDP ports are, where they came from, and why they act the way they do now, and what we should do about it as sysadmins, as managers of computers. Um, and this stuff changes all the time. We like to believe that uh, the people that make, that create, that dream <coughs> have godlike capabilities that they see into the future and they prepare for all eventualities. But nothing could be further for, from the truth for the internet. The people that created the internet were kids. They were your age, most of them, uh, some of them were younger. Uh, they never had a long-term plan. They just tried things, and when they worked out, uh, they were happy. When they didn't work out, which was most of the time, then they tried something else. It's just they happened to be more persistent than flexible than and flexible than anybody else working in that period, and they managed to pull off creating a worldwide network of computers. The kids creating the internet were more surprised, I think, than anybody when it succeeded. Uh, there was big money in creating a worldwide network of computers and had been tried by big money interests. Uh, things like CompuServe, uh, DeckNet, uh, IBM had an attempt. All the big names had an attempt at creating a worldwide network and all of them had poured uh, in today's money, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars into the attempt and all of it failed. Um, so, the uh, guys designing the internet focused basically on simplicity to start with. They started by creating a network that created, that connected basically any computer to any computer across the world, wherever they were. Uh, and that was the simple core of it. Uh, but of course that turned out not to be actually very useful. Having a computer talk to another computer is okay, but for the most part computers don't have interesting things to say to each other. Uh, they went back and thought it over a little bit and after a while they realized they didn't actually want computers to talk to computers anywhere on the internet. They wanted computer programs to talk to computer programs anywhere on the internet. That is, they didn't want to target a computer, they wanted to target a program. They wanted an email program on one computer to be able to send a message to an email program on another computer. They wanted the clock program on one computer to be able to talk to the clock program on another computer. They wanted the database program on one computer to talk to the database program on another computer. Uh, back then, the computers cost millions of dollars. There weren't very many of them. And they were all the same. Uh, they all ran the same program. So basically, they started off by using program identifiers. They said, hey, let's send a message from this computer, uh, 10.0.0.1 and this program, that's uh, the email program, always ran as program ID 25. Uh, from that program off to this computer, 10.0.0.2, and the email program identifier number 25. And that's how it got started. The response just went the other way. Um, and that was good and, and that was fine and then a little while later some enterprising fool jerk realized that it was possible let's see the clock program was program 13 database program was 389 uh, 25 13 389 some enterprising fool realized that it was possible to send a message from uh, this computer's database program to this computer's
email program and thus spam was born and there was much rejoicing uh, that guy had to be physically restrained but it was too late and we were off and running uh, for a little while the messages on the internet looked like that uh, they would go from a database program to an email program the response would be just the opposite it would go from the email program back to there and that couplet of connections that was formed where That couplet of connections that was formed with traffic going one way and traffic going another way uh, was was uh, what embodied most of the connections on the internet. Um, in those early days, these programs, again written by kids, they were absolute crap. Uh, and we were all doomed unless we could replace them. Um, I mean, the early email program called SendMail averaged two program bugs per line of code. Every time there was a patch, it would patch five lines and it would create 25 bugs. It was, um, uh, it, it was bad. It was really, really bad. Uh, eventually realized that uh, we were doomed unless we could throw those programs away and just replace them. So, uh, let's see, how do you do that? Touch it with your hand and lift it up. Cool. So, they wrote replacements. And they plopped those replacements down at the same place. That is, the new mail program also, they plopped down at, and had it run as uh, program number 25, uh, but uh, it was different code with less bugs. But the way they made it work is they made it so that the new program talked like the old program. That is, it didn't matter which program you used for an email program as long as they talked the same. If it quacked like a duck, it was a duck. So, um, almost all of the early programs got replaced, got replaced frequently. That's why the internet still functional, so we replace those programs all the time. Uh, but, we've kept, ever since the beginning, the way that they talk as the abstraction layer as the commonality, as the thing that stays when the code changes. The way they talk is now called a protocol. That is a style, a way of talking. It's essentially a language. And for every uh, one of those useful programs that we put on the internet that would uh, communicate back and forth we kept their way of talking even though that useful program changes over time oh come on use the other end. so we created an abstraction at first when you sent information to port 25 you meant we were talking to send mail Now, when you send it to port 25, it actually means we're talking SMTP, which is the name we gave for the way that the early send mail program would bundle up email messages and describe them. SMTP is the protocol used to describe email messages and how to transfer them. So, nowadays, it's not code that's important. And it's really not which port we send information to. It's how we send it. It's the protocol we use to send it. Uh, 
those protocols are what has continued to this day. Um, again, in the early days, we had a well-meaning group. They're still around, called IANA. I A N A. Internet Authority of uh, Busybody, kind of things. I guess N stands for busybodies. Uh, and they started keeping track of all of these useful programs, which ports people put them on, and uh, kept that all in a great big database. They maintain that database to this day. And that database looked like something like uh, 13 and the clock thing, and 21 was an FTP, a file transfer thing, and 23 was a, a thing called Telnet. T L N E T. And 25 was email. And so on. They had a list. Uh, um, and their purpose was is to help people to figure out what had already been used. That way, you wouldn't have people put two programs on the same port, one in this part of the internet and the other on that part of the internet, and have confusion over when you got the message which protocol to use. Um, they also had an interesting suggestion on how we allocate the ports. Before, we had message, we had programs talking to programs using the port that that program was running on. Uh, after, they said, well, let's try doing it this way. We'll have a computer here and a computer here with messages going back and forth. And we'll have, we'll call these computers servers and they'll run the services and they'll use the services will be running on ports uh, 1 down to 1024 and we'll call these ones users or clients and uh, we'll have them just temporarily use a port a free port one of the ones we haven't allocated to any purpose yet so they were using the high ports from uh, 1025 all the way down to uh, down to 65535 65k 64k actually and that was the birth of the concept we call client server computing that is instead of having uh, connections running between long-running programs that ran all the time, we'd have connections running uh, from just a, a connection request coming from a user, from something, from anything, and going to a long-running program. So uh, it, they, that made it easy to issue a request. You didn't have to write code to issue a request. You just brought up some kind of client program and had it issue the request for you. Um, the uh, way those went back and forth was just the way you see conversations go back and forth nowadays. This computer, 0 2 would send a request from some high order port, three, four, five, six, seven, and send that off to a server machine somewhere, 0 0.0.1, and uh, the request would specify where, which protocol they wanted to talk. That it would specify which port they wanted to see. Again, 25 for email. And then the response would come back the other way from 25 to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And that's the pattern you see nowadays all the time. 
all of our computers do that all the time. The only thing that changes is which particular high order port they're using all the time. As every service, every protocol got its own niche, its own port, they became isolated. They didn't talk to each other. They talked to clients. And they didn't talk to general purpose clients. A web server talked to a web client. A uh, NTP server talked to an NTP client. Uh, a mail server talked to a mail client. They formed their own little, little groups. And no longer did you have a mail program trying to talk to a database program. They didn't need to understand each other. So what happened was the protocols fractured. Before then, we were working towards creating a universal language for computer programs to talk to computer programs. A universal, extendable, kind of almost human, in terms of its flexibility, uh, language that they would use as the protocol. <laughs> Uh, when it went to client server computing, we threw all that away and just created specific tailored languages, protocols. So the email client knows all about how to talk about email. It doesn't know diddly about the web. Uh, the upshot of it is everyone, we, we created a Tower of Babel. Every one of those protocols went their own way, they become their own flexible language, and none of them are like any of the others. Currently on the internet we have almost 30, 40,000 of those protocols, and none of them are like any of the others, and it, it takes even a really good internet program a few days to get up to speed on each one of them. Tower of Babel uh, is exactly the situation we've got now. Lots of protocols, lots of languages, no uh, comprehension of uh, from from one to another. Um, during back during the early days, servers were really really expensive, and it was expected that every server would run every possible service. There were only 15 or 20 services. Uh, I mean, once you exchanged email and moved files around, what more did you ever actually ever want to do on the internet? Uh, <laughs> so uh, every server ran every uh, service and that lasted for a couple of years. And then the, then the number of these programs these number of these servers kept skyrocketing. And the base drive there wasn't money in those days. In those days, almost all of the services were being written by a uh, academic department at the University of Berkeley. And in order to get a degree, you had to write a service. So people were writing services just simply so they could get a degree. And they didn't care whether or not the code was good, whether or not the service was important, whether or not. And those were how all the other services got created. For the most part, the academic advisors tried to limit the students to writing something that was worthwhile. Uh, but those were all the early services on the internet. Uh, they came out of the uh, BSD-based Unix. And uh, all of our modern, uh, all of our modern OS's just adopted their code wholesale. Anyway, every server ran every service and that worked really good until they ran out of memory, which happened after a couple of academic years. So they still had really expensive computers even though uh, they didn't have enough memory to run all the services, so they did a workaround. What they did is they created the slash Etsy slash services file. And that was a list of, that was a list that looked like this. It said uh, Echo, uh, what was Echo 7? Yeah. 7. 
TCP, and I don't know, um, time 13 slash <coughs> UDP, and uh, 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 SSH 22 slash TCP, and so on. And what would happen is when a internet packet came in, a master demon called the internet demon, or INET D, uh, would look at that packet and see what port it was to. And then it would take that port and look that port up in the services table and find out which program had to be running. And if that program wasn't currently running, it would launch it. And then uh, it would wait and watch the connections, and when the last connection for a service went away, it would kill the service. So uh, for that period of time, which was so oh, 70s or so, uh, the uh, services became demand-based. They were loaded when there was a request for them. They were unloaded when there was no request for them. And that allowed the servers to continue to run all services, but latency was a bitch. Every time you requested something, you had to wait, wait, wait for the packet to get there for the remote server to launch something, and eventually it would send it back. So uh, we were used to, we'd type something, hit enter, and go get the cup of coffee or whatever, because it was not going to come back in under a minute, even on the most powerful computer. Uh, also, there were lots of security programs because uh, enterprising people found that they could manipulate any computer in the world by sending the right assortment of packets to it and cause it to up down, up down, up down, up down its services and thrash all kinds of things and uh, the, no good came of that. Eventually, reality caught up with the sysadmin profession. And reality looked like this. It was number of services. And because after a while, it was not just the academics that were writing services. Every business was writing a service for their particular business uh, needs. So the number of possible number of services was kind of tending toward infinite. Uh, it was also the cost of computers, uh, let's see, which tended eventually down toward one dollar, which is about how much it cost to fire up an Amazon instance. And it was mostly, and this was possibly the steepest one of all, it was the cost of complexity. That is, if you ran every service on every computer, you had to configure them all. You had to understand them all. You had to make sure they were all configured properly and working properly all the time. Uh, that was killing sysadmins. And it was really wrecking security. So as these, the cost for individual computers or virtual machines or uh, whatever we could, we could create that worked like a computer came down, we realized that it just made sense to only run one service per computer. Uh, that's starting about the mid 2000s. Uh, it was cheaper, it was so much simpler, and it was so much more secure because when a computer only ran mail and that's all it did, it would do a certain set of behaviors, you could describe those behaviors, you could look to see if it did anything else, and when it did anything else, it was hacked or needed attention or was broken or something. Another uh, change that came along is as the number of services went up, the IANA, we're back to these guys again, recommended list of dynamic ports shrank and shrank. At first it was 1025 up to 64K. 
but they blew past 1025 real quickly and then just kept going. Uh, currently, IANA has about 40,000 listed services and they've allocated ports to every one of them. <laughs> so their, uh, their current recommendation is that uh, when you set up your computer and set up the range of dynamic ports that the users and processes are going to use, it should be 40, was that 41K? I looked it up yesterday. Uh, uh, yeah. 49 to 64K should be used as the dynamic port range to stay away from all the ports that they've allocated for some services and such, such things. The problem is, is this is just too small for a modern, busy server that gets lots of connections. Even for a modern, busy home computer that does lots of connections, it's too small. The early Skype and the early BitTorrent users we're running out of dynamic ports all the time. So today, if you look at how your computer is configured, there's all the ones where they've used the dynamic ports in order to make money, Windows. Windows arbitrarily limits the range of the dynamic ports. Uh, um, so the home edition only have 5,000 dynamic ports that can only make a small number of connections. Uh, the uh, server edition of Windows is the exact same code except for they change the number of dynamic ports. Mm. Uh, so uh, um, Linux, for example, all the Linuxes, they ship with uh, a dynamic range from 33K up to about 60K is the default dynamic range. Okay, now, the whole point of this was to avoid the services. But the question is then, what happens when you fire up a service and it's for managing your light bulbs or whatever, mm -hmm. and it decides to use its given port, and its given port is smack dab in the middle of where you've configured your dynamic range to be? Any ideas? Well, you fire up that service, uh, say your Hue light bulb service. It goes and allocates port 41,385. Uh, you're on a Linux box. What happens is your Linux box says, oh, somebody just requested that port. I'll mark it busy. That's all that happens. Everything works just fine. There really is no problem if you need to on a server of going back and allocating 1025 to 64k as your dynamic port range because all the servers when they allocate their ports they'll just get a get a uh, get a port marked as busy and then it won't allocate it again you may need to do that if you end up managing something that's really really busy Okay, next thing. NAT. How does home NAT work? You have the internet, and coming from the internet, you have your ISP, and then you've got your home router. Because you have a, uh, because it's a router, it has more than one IP address. So its outside IP address might be something like 1.2.3.4. Its inside IP address might be something like 192.168.0.1. Now you end up having a whole bunch of things in your home, your home PC, 
might have an address that looks like 192.168.0.2. Now, when your home PC sends a request to your NAT router, it'll uh, for a web page in the outside world. That request could look something like um, 192.168.0.2. Requesting, oops, on some dynamic port, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, requesting 4.4.4.4, see if it's in, um, what's that, the Cloudflare, Cloudflare web server on port 80. Okay? That packet makes it to your NAT router, and your NAT router uh, then sets up in its NAT table an equivalence. It says, okay, from now on, we're just going to consider, um, we'll make this request for this guy, and we're just going to consider, um, the request we make, 1.2.3.4, colon, uh, uh, 3.4.7.8.2 is being equal to this, 7. Uh, routers rewrite packets all the time. Normally they just rewrite the Ethernet addresses. But a NAT router, when it gets a packet, it reaches in and rewrites IP addresses and port numbers. But it keeps track of who it's, it keeps track of this equivalence table where, where the things it creates are equivalent to a request that it receives. As long as it keeps track of that table, then when it sends a packet out, it knows how to rewrite them. And when it gets a packet back, it knows how to rewrite them. That's actually pretty easy if you've just realized that the router is, is rewriting the packet, changing the IP addresses and the ports. Port forwarding is even simpler. In port forwarding, you have a PC at home that is running a web server. So that web server will be on 192.168.0.2 on port 80. So in addition to a NAT table, am I then expanding that? Oh, no wonder those are getting so scrunchy. I've been involuntarily expanding that. Huh. Okay, so in addition to a NAT table, it has a port forward table. And in the port forward table, it just creates a very simple equivalence, which is 1.2.3.4.80 is equivalent to 192.168.0.2. And again, when it gets a packet coming in for its port 80, it just rewrites it with the target IP address inside and passes it along. And any response packets it rewrites and passes back. So both of those are actually fairly simple as soon as you realize that uh, your home router rewrites packets. Your home, router, your home router is always adding a little latency as it stores the entire packet, examines it, figures out how it needs to be rewritten, rewrites it, and then sends it out. But other than that latency, which can be in the nanoseconds, can be really, really fast because home routers are at least as powerful as a Raspberry Pi nowadays and are running at gigahertz. Other than that latency, it's uh, there's really no problem. 
packets don't get lost, your home router isn't, isn't, isn't discarding things, and if you do port forwarding, it's just like putting your web server up on the internet. It has all the capabilities of any other internet-based server. So you need to protect it. Even though it's at home, you need to protect it, uh, just like any other internet-based thing. Speaking of protection, if you are a sysadmin or managing a computer, should you change a server's default port? Should you continue to run your web server on port 80? Should you continue to run your SSH server on port 22, or should you change that? Um, well, in the early days when every server ran every service, the wisdom that got disseminated on the internet was that you should never change those ports because it was just security by obscurity and if an attacker wanted to know, he could just port scan you and figure out where you'd move things to. Uh, but that hasn't been true for over 20 years. It hasn't been true since we went to limiting uh, which server ran which port. I mean, which server ran which service. Nowadays, there is a huge difference from an attacker's point of view versus do you scan 65,000 machines and look for port 22? Or do you scan one machine and look at all the ports on that one machine? from an, an attacker's point of view, and, and, and this is real, this isn't stuff I made up. I spent 10 years running a, let's track all of the attack on the internet program. Uh, from an attacker's point of view, it is always way better to scan 65,000 machines and look for port 22. What you'll find is lots and lots of machines where they have unconfigured services that are poorly managed and you can easily take them over. If you decide to scan one computer to figure out where they move the SSH server, your reward is you may find where they moved it to, but what you will find is a well-managed SSH server, which is almost never worth attacking. You're always better off uh, spraying across the internet and finding poorly managed services than you are scanning a single machine. Uh, by changing which ports your services run on, you immediately avoid all the automated attack, which means you can uh, set up your login so that if you ever get a connection looks bad, immediately look at it because it's not an automated attack, it's targeted. It's somebody who cares about you. It means you need to take action right now. Uh, the thing is though, it all hinges on can you configure all the clients to know about the upgraded ports. So there's no point in changing a web server. Because all the clients are the all your potential clients are scattered across the entire internet, you can never get to them all and tell them to move to the new port. But there is a big incentive and a big payoff for changing the default port of anything where you manage all the clients and you can update them to use the new port. So anything that you use for remote access, RDP, VNC. SSH, all those should you should change the port. You'll avoid all the automated attacks and you'll immediately uh, move to a uh, more easy to a, a defend environment. By changing the ports, you eliminate an automated attack, you force your attackers to work harder, and it makes it easier to detect your attackers. Okay, well, that's basically everything I know about ports.